I'll let Diane in. I just saw her. Good. Uh, Hi, everybody. I'm... Are we ready to go? Yeah, we are ready to go. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Uh, it's April. It's a beautiful month, and the weather's been so, so nice. I'm glad you were able to make it. My name is Walter Sanders. Uh, I'm serving as president of Fourth Ward CLT. And on behalf of the board and all the volunteers and committee members, I welcome you to this neighborhood meeting. Uh, I just want to kick off on a couple things. The garden tour is going smoothly, famously. It's scheduled for May 22nd and May 23rd. Tickets are on sale now on our website, fourthwardclt.org, and it's limited to the neighborhood first before we publicize it uh, to outside the neighborhood. So now would be a great time to, to buy tickets. It's easy, you can, you can buy online. We'll also start the volunteer process. We always need volunteers. Uh, and that sign up screen, sign up genius will be ready early next week. And it's sort of, it, as usual, uh, if you volunteer to do two shifts, so a shift is two hours. If you do two two hour shifts, you earn a flex ticket that you can use on either day, either Saturday the 22nd or the 23rd, and you can split up your volunteer duties. So please spread the word, especially among the neighbors before we publicize this widely and get to the website and buy some tickets. Um, I've got some real, real exciting news. There was a collaborative effort by the board uh, and we worked hard. It took almost a month and a half, two months maybe, to create a new mission statement. I'll give you a chance just to peek at that. So the new mission statement, and you'll see in a moment the new vision statement, this is really gonna help us. Uh, it should help us attract business partners, sponsors, and better position us to earn some grants, which is gonna be important, uh, especially because our income is a little bit low so far. So this, this is really important. The mission statement we think covers the, it captures the essence of the fourth ward. We worked hard on it and I would just love you to uh, put your thumbs up and clap and welcome it. Let's go to the next slide if we could. We've created a list of values too that we think are inherent to fourth ward CLT. They're, they're part of our ethic, they're part of our total values. It's what we cherish, and I think it's what makes the Fourth Ward CLT really distinctive. And we can move to the next one. So the vision statement is is heroic. Uh, I've always thought that the vision is where we want to end up. It's the big picture, um, and I think this is a noble vision. It'll be amazing if we can attain it. But we, simply, we want to be the finest urban neighborhood in the United States and a place where we can be proud to live, work, and play. So we worked hard on that. And I really want to thank the community, too, the neighborhood, for, for embracing these values. Next thing, we've got a another green and clean uh, Fourth Ward CLT green team event coming up. This should be special. Saturday, May 15th, you'll be able to... Uh, to sign up, there's a link here. You can also get, it's gonna be on the calendar too, Shirley. Whoops, you're muted. Yes, it's on Facebook and on the event calendar on the website. And this will be fun. Uh, we supply equipment. So uh, it's, it's kind of neat. We've got about three dozen sets of picker uppers and uh, it's a great way to meet neighbors and also do some good, <clears throat> some good cleanup prior to the, uh, the garden tour. All right, is Jasmine on? Yes, I'm here. Great, Jasmine. Could you give us just a quick overview of the porch pop-in and a word or two on uh, the success of the Easter egg hunt? Yep, and um, Shirley, do I have? Yes, you, you have access to show your slides. Perfect. All right. All right, hopefully you guys can see my screen. Um, real quick, I just wanted to remind everybody, um, we're still asking people to join our social committee. So if you're interested, go ahead and scan the QR code here. 
Um, I won't walk through everything that I, I did last time, but I just want to keep reminding everybody these opportunities. Um, Walter just mentioned all the cool stuff that's available on uh, the calendar. So feel free to um, follow these steps to merge your calendar, calendar to be always in the know of what updates are. Um, and lastly, you can use Remind 101. Um, so all you have to do is text at, at FW Social to 81010 to receive reminders and updates of upcoming events. Um, so our first upcoming event is our April porch pop-in. Our March one went and went quite fabulously. We had beautiful weather. A lot, a lot of people came out. And we were, we had a, a great time. Um, and we are actually doing it at the same location. It's a really great location, a lot of space. We can easily social distance, but there's a lot of um, area for us to um, see, to sit as well. Um, feel free to bring your own drinks or snacks. Um, and that's going to be uh, April 30th at 6 p.m. Um, all porch pop-ins are the last Friday of every month. Um, those are subject, subject to change um, in, in case of whether we may adjust. But that's why it's important to keep watching our calendar and we'll send those updates as well. Um, and then the last thing, as Walter mentioned, is our Easter egg hunt. I just want to say uh, thank you to everyone that attended. Um, here's a, a few snapshots. Um, they're available on our social media as well. Um, we had a great turnout. We had an Easter bunny that everybody took pictures with. Um, and it, it was a lot of fun. Um, a, a lot of eggs. <laughs> Um, so we appreciate it. But again, um, make sure that you, uh, you know, sign up for those reminders as well as um, follow our calendars to be in the loop for all of these really cool events that we're starting to launch um, now that the weather is getting better and the restrictions are getting more and more lifted. And I actually just got a notification that the QR code needs to be um, updated. So if you tried to scan that, I apologize. Um, utilize the Survey Monkey link and I can post a new QR code for you guys. So I appreciate it. Um, that's all I had. Thanks, Jasmine. John, you want to give us a, a quick tease on partnership, please? Absolutely. Thanks, Walter. I'm John Kacharis. I'm the head of the Partnerships Committee. Uh, we've been meeting uh, every couple of weeks and have worked on hammering out a, a business membership option. It's going to be very exciting to offer to uh, local businesses or anybody that conducts business in the Fort Ward area. And we're going to capitalize on uh, more community engagements with those businesses uh, by providing a package of offering to those businesses, how we can promote those businesses through a website, in turn generating some revenue for our fourth world organization. In addition, just to let you all know, we are hoping as well to uh, put together an actual uh, fourth ward road race, uh, be a running race at some time in the fall. We're discussing that now. It may or may not happen, but um, just want to let you all know that we are working on that to see if we can uh, work through some logistics on that item as well. Thank you. Thanks, John. Shirley. All right, while I get my uh, slides ready, the place to buy tickets right now, uh, the, before the general public knows about it, go to um, the website and click on events and the garden tour link, or go to the menu and scroll down to garden tour, click on that and you can buy tickets tonight but it will be announced to the public tomorrow. And let's see, my slides are up. Um, uh, membership in Fourth Ward. You can um, buy an optional membership to Fourth Ward. Household is $50 each, individual is 25. And amazingly enough, a condo or multifamily membership, this is paid by your HOA or COA, is only $10 per unit. And some people ask, and, and some that have been members for years don't know what where those funds go. But your membership provides free atten um, attendance to our social events, early access to purchase tickets to special events, like you're getting the one day notice for the garden tour. And you'll also get a few days notice for the holiday home tour also. And those do sell out. Um, neighborhood meetings, enhanced security, 
the fourth ward dog park that's coming, uh, opportunity to volunteer and get involved. And also being a member of fourth ward Charlotte means that you're a member of our foundation. We have a nonprofit, a 501c3, and revenue from the garden tour, the holiday home tour, and other uh, events that we charge prices, uh, charge for, that we'll have tickets for, those fundraising efforts go to collaborations with nonprofits in the area, uh, donated to nonprofits, or local Fourth Ward Park projects or service projects. So the money that is brought in from our uh, special events does not go to um, the oyster roast or the Easter egg hunt or the Halloween parade. That is uh, paid for through your membership. So the next slide, just a moment. Um, if you wonder how to join, you can <laughs> click on the support button on the website or you can mail a check. And here's the address. You can also email Walter, president at fourthwardclt.org if you have a question about membership or what membership involves. And you can go on the website and click on membership and reread what I went over a few minutes ago. You can also see who joined this year, the individual members, the household members, and then also the multifamily housing. And as you can see, not all of the uh, multifamily housing, the, the buildings and the condos have responded yet to purchase their membership. So if you don't see your building, if you could contact your board chair or your property manager and see if they somehow overlooked our email uh, to join Fourth Ward. And it would be great if you could help us out with that. Um, we are forming a community awareness committee and the meeting is next Monday, April the 26th at 7 p.m. All Fourth Ward neighbors are invited. Topics for this particular committee um, are staying informed. For example, the Charlotte City Council's 2040 plan. Are we in favor of it? Are we opposed? We, we need someone um, to help us uh, stay in touch and up to date. Topics will also be collaborating with other nonprofits in the area, developing a relationship with Edwin Towers and Poplar Grove apartment neighbors who are in Fourth Ward, and then additional uh, non-safety issues, scheduling service projects. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, then we would love for you to be a part of the Community Awareness Committee and our upcoming meeting. And Haley, um, are you ready? I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, sure. Oh, perfect. You've already got my slide. That's awesome. So um, we are super excited to announce our first endeavor with Fourth Ward merchandise for the year. We're going to have um, some custom Fourth Ward Charlotte masks. Uh, so these are going to hopefully be up on the website any day now for pre-order, and we're going to be distributing them at the Garden Tour. Um, and they'll also be available for sale at the Garden Tour if you aren't able to pre-order. Um, and the pricing will be $10 for one mask, or you can get a discount if you're buying two and do $15 for the two masks. Um, they are super comfortable and they are great to have. Um, and we're really looking forward to getting these out to everybody. Um, I also have a quick update on the dog park. Um, so we received bids for that uh, two weeks ago for the parks department uh, from different companies that are going to be moving forward with the construction on the dog park. So we are on track to start demolition, um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks here, and then be up and ready by late summer, maybe early fall. So um, thank you everybody for your patience. And as we get more <laughs> updates on the dog park, we will definitely keep you posted. Thanks so much, Haley. Appreciate it. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Andy Mock. Uh, he's with CATS. He's our expert on the, the new Silver Line and what has changed since the last time we met him uh, with the Silver Line coming through Fourth Ward. Take it away, Andy. Thank you so much. And I'll try to be quick, Walter, but I've got a lot of information, so we'll probably have to have a follow up. Uh, can everyone see the screen okay? Great. Yep. Nodding heads. I'm going to jump right to the, to the punchline. Uh, for the most part, uh, let's see. Uh, so, but before I go straight to the punchline, I will have to say a couple big picture things. So the Silver Line is a, a, a 26 mile long light rail project that goes from Belmont into uh, Union County. And it's, it really spans you know, the whole width of uh, Mecklenburg County. 
we're at the very beginning of that planning and, and design process. So we're getting ready to have our uh, alignment adopted to the Metropolitan Transit Commission next week uh, on April 28th after a very extensive public engagement process. We went to the MTC for information last month. So we've really been beating the bushes to get you know people understanding where we're going to from a uh, Silver Line perspective. And there's really uh, no place more important than, than Fort, Fourth Ward as it relates to the Silver Line integrating into the community. This shows the, the big picture. This is the whole alignment map that goes from Belmont over to Indian Trail. I'm not gonna go through all that since if folks have been following along through the public engagement process, you'll have heard this speech a number of times. But it's really, you know, it's, it's very similar and operating characteristics and designs, just like the blue line, just going to a different area. Uh, and really when it gets into to Fourth Ward into the center city area, really the, the biggest question is really getting from Charlotte Gateway Station around and across Graham Street and then following 11th Street out towards Independence Boulevard. So really there, we've been uh, out to the Fourth Ward community. This will be our third time in some form or fashion. We've been directly out to the Fourth, uh, Fourth Ward community on top of our various public engagement meetings. So we feel like we've, we've done a lot of uh, uh, bringing along of the community. Really the question is about how we get across Grand Street. Uh, that's really the question that we, we talked about last time we were out here. And last time we were out here, we kind of talked about some options. You know, we could go under, we could go over, we could go at, right? So we've done some evaluation. Last time we, when I say at, it means at grade. Uh, we did, we've done a lot of evaluations last time we presented pros and cons, you know, we kind of indicated that we were leaning to more of a bridge with light rail would go over the intersection so we would stay out of the traffic. There were some concerns about what, what that, what, what's that going to look like and how, how's that going to feel? So we went back and kind of done, have done some homework and developed some visualizations that we could present tonight because there's really no better way to describe what we're talking about than a visualization. So I'm going to quickly go through some visualizations today. Uh, and we can talk about kind of some of the thoughts there and I'll do a brief presentation about each one of them. So this is kind of the, the big picture. Uh, you see uh, Smith Street, Graham Street right here. The light rail is denoted by this purple zone. So that's the alignment. As you, after we, coming out of Charlotte Gateway Station, we then follow along Smith Street near the railroad tracks and then bridge over Graham Street and then along 11th Street out towards Independence Boulevard with a stop near the Blue Line extension. To kind of zoom in a little bit more, uh, so you see Graham Street in your foreground. Uh, this is ADM. Uh, we're showing a elevated guideway that, come, that comes across here through the backside of the Lifespan Community Center. If folks are familiar with that site. We're, we're doing our best to try to avoid that facility and keep them active and having an aerial station above the intersection of 10th and Graham with access points on either side of the station before it enters into the 11th Street corridor. Right and, uh, above here is 277. Uh, and one thing that we heard uh, last time were some, some thoughts. There was definitely some pros and cons people were thinking about the bridge. There were some really interesting thoughts about how this could be a great gateway for the uh, Fourth Ward community and how the, what the sites, what it's gonna look like if you stand on the bridge. So we, we modeled a couple of views of what that gateway experience could be and what that views of, of center city might be from the, the platform. So this, is, this model right here kind of shows what it would look like for you if you were to stand on the I-277 bridge looking toward Fourth Ward and what that bridge could look like. This is a very general, you know, blank, blank. slate of what it could be. Uh, but there's a, definitely an opportunity for that to be any number of any number of design uh, intent and, and materials. So the idea is that that could be some great gateway for folks entering into Fourth Ward from Camp North End and other parts of Graham Street to really give an awareness to the community. Uh, and to kind of address like what's, what, what's going to look like if you're up on that station and you're looking towards Center City, what kind of views are you going to have? And, and the punchline is you're going to have really great views of Center City. Uh, from, from the, you'll be elevated about 30 feet in the air. And you have great views of Center City from the platform. Um, there's all, lots of opportunities for uh, aesthetic treatments and we are working closely with the Historic, historic District Commission. We, we, some of this bridge is within the Historic District so they will, will be working closely with, with that group on material selection and design. 
And so that's something we've had one introductory meeting with a historic district commission uh, two weeks ago, and we intend to do some follow-up with them in the next couple of weeks to ensure that we're complying with the intent and spirit of the historic district. And the last slide I have tonight is really to talk about what that experience could be down at the ground level. This is where we're standing, we're standing on the lifespan site. You're looking towards Graham Street. Uh, lifespan is off to your right. Uh, the Graham Street heading out of Center City is to the left. And this is showing up an opportunity for a plaza uh, adjacent and underneath the structure directly adjacent to the lifespan facility. Uh, this is also part of, intended to be part of the rail trail. So as part of this Silver Line program, we're also planning a, a rail trail that goes the entire length of the Silver Line from the whole 26 miles. Uh, so uh, how we actually do that, you know, we have to figure that out. But the, we're trying to come up with a vision for how we can connect rail trail through the entire length because uh, one of the biggest successes of the Blue Line, the original Blue Line, was the, was the rail trail and everyone loves it. So we're trying to start from the very beginning with the rail trail front of mind and how can we design that into the project rather than have it be an afterthought. So um, where we are, where we're going from here, so we're, we're going for the alignment adoption uh, next week to the Metropolitan Drainage Commission. Then after that, and in the summer into the fall, we're gonna be doing a lot of station area planning, talking about infrastructure, talk, and then we're gonna start, also start to get into some of those design decisions and discussions about materials and bridge types and form liners and all that good stuff that's gonna make uh, th these great places. So uh, Walter, that was a, a lot of information in a very short amount of time. Uh, and I'll take any questions folks might have. Thank you, Andy. I think what we'll do is have people um, uh, put their questions in the chat feature and then okay. feed them to you perhaps, if you can hang with us for a little bit. I once we see what. You. Perfect. Andy, thank you so, so much. Anyone? What questions you have? Uh, we do have a question. I, I think this was dealt with in the previous neighborhood meetings that you had, but why is it uh, not underground instead of elevated? Right. So it, we have one of the reasons, the main reasons that it's not underground, there, there's a couple different things with underground. In our evaluation of under versus over, we looked at both options. Uh, so if it's over, if it's under, one of the big things about under is there's a, a, a long transition point where you're, you can't do anything with. It's, it's, they call them portals. It's basically a trench that is six to 800 feet long where the, where the light rail transitions from the lower grade to the above grade. And there's not, you really can't do anything with that area because it's an exposed open cut. It's, a, it's an open trench and it's really a waste of space. There's really nothing you can do with that because we're not, going down and staying down. We're, we will be going down just to get under the intersection then back up. And those transition points are very difficult to deal with. And they're, they're kind of ugly and, and really not much you can do with them. We've done those before. We have one up at UNC Charlotte uh, and, and they're, they're challenging and not the best. The other things, I mean, just practically from a, a project progression perspective, anytime you're going underground, you get into all kinds of problems about utilities and gold mines in Center City and all kinds of challenges with construction and keeping that during open during operations. So there's a lot of practical concerns, but there's also a lot of land use and neighborhood challenges with that with that depressed line, creating those trenches and open cuts on either side. And then I'm going to put a couple of questions together because there's okay. quite a few coming in. Um, putting them together, why not run a line down 12th Street? What does it look like past Graham toward Church Street? And then is there going to be any noise issues for folks living on 11th and 10th Street? So the, 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 I think the first question is about 12th and, and coming to this area. One, one of the big challenges is we really want to be on the uptown side of 277 for the station at the Blue Line. And you kind of have to pick if, if you're going to be on, if you're going to have your light rail station on the blue line to be in center city, this is over here at 11th street, then you really can't go the whole way over and bridge over Brookshire and then come back. Once you're there, you got it. Once you got to pick your side, once you're there, you're there. Uh, so that was the decision at the time was to really have that closer to that energy of center city and closer to the station at ninth street. So we could facilitate better connections so that people getting off the blue line, could easily get to the silver line instead of having to walk another 
you know, 800 to 1,000 feet. So we wanted to make sure that that connection is really good. Uh, the, the second question was about church, I believe. Sure. I mean, sorry, Andy, additionally, I just was gonna mention that um, there's challenges with the freight railroad uh, over near ABM as well. So that's where CSX and Norfolk Southern um, also converge. And so uh, what, how you would actually get back over to be in a, a location where you could reach Gateway Station uh, it could end up being, uh, you know, that, that would be extremely challenging to, to make happen from an engineering standpoint due to the important juncture right there for the freight railroad track. And, and so what was your second question? Uh, what does it look like past Graham towards Church Street next to 277? Um, um, church, church, this would be church, okay. Uh, so there, the, the light rail would be, if you can follow my cursor, we would then be paralleling uh, 11th Street and 279, trying to squeeze our way along this corridor. In many cases, we're likely going to be rebuilding 11th Street in some form or fashion, uh, not rebuilding the Brookshire, but rebuilding and potentially readjust, adjusting um, 11th Street. The, the entire, this entire section from CGS over towards Central Avenue is proposed to be an aerial, it's basically proposed to be a structure because of all of the different undulations and, and, uh, and infrastructure that we have to cross to get through this area. And the third question, Shirley, was noise. Um, so uh, two, and I'll put two together on this. Is there any noise issues for folks living on 10th and 11th? And will you be able to see in the windows of the garrison on 10th? Right. So regarding noise, uh, there's a, there, we will do an evaluation of noise as it relates to uh, the, the light rail. So when during, as part of our environmental work, we'll do noise studies to evaluate whether there is any noise impacts to, to the sensitive receptors or, or residential communities. As we kind of go through that process, if there are, if our study denotes that there's anything that's above and beyond the existing ambient sound. Now, and some things like 10th, 10th Street, they're, they're, they're there might be, and there might be some mitigation required. A lot of times we're, we're following like interstate or highway corridors where it's very loud anyways. That might may be more like it over on 11th Street. So we would study the ambient noise and compare that to if you add light rail to that ambient noise, it doesn't make it any worse. If it does, then we would evaluate whether we, we need to do anything as far as noise mitigation or abatement. And we would do that as part of the project. Um, and regarding 11th Street, I mean, I, the I think I think the, the issue there is that I think 11th Street because it's so close, and I, I'm not as familiar as, as, as y'all are with 11th Street, but it might be it might be pretty loud as it is. Our study would have to evaluate whether the noise as it is today is kind of outweighs the noise of light rail, which is very quiet as compared to a highway. Uh, so we would have to do that study to evaluate whether there would be any noise impacts on, on 11th. Thank you. Uh, is there any consideration for rail at grade? Um, at, at 10th Street? I, I don't know. That was the full question. Okay. Well, we did, we did take a look at that. Uh, there is an option that looks at that. However, one of the challenges, the traffic uh, is so bad on Graham Street that when we looked at it, we, that the traffic would really snarl all in the afternoon and the morning. So when we started to run through scenarios with and traffic analysis with uh, the Department of Transportation and other folks in the city and state, that they said it's really unlikely that we could get an at-grade crossing approved because of the, the existing traffic counts. Okay, I'll put another couple together. Could you show the overview again? Uh, they want to know, can you take it to the airport? Can you sh show us the two stations inside Fourth Ward? And... Um, See if there's anything else. Yeah, Shirley, may I, may I interrupt for one moment? Yes, of course. Um, Andy, if, if you don't mind putting your, you, you've got a great website. If you could put that in the chat, yeah, we'll bundle we up the questions, them. file them, and then share them with you. And perhaps uh, we can get you connected to the other questions. We've got the chief coming up, and he's a busy guy. Um, yes. Andy, I really appreciate you coming this evening, sharing your expertise. If you could post the website and then hang with us in case there's any time left, no promises, but uh, you, you, we'll get these questions to you and these other comments to you somehow. Okay. All right, thank, great. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Andy. Let me shall stop sharing. Uh, I'm proud to introduce Chris Connolly. He's our committee chair for neighborhood safety. Chris, please take it away. Sure, thank you everybody for joining us. And before we get started with Chief Jennings, um, I'd like to acknowledge one of the longest serving members, uh, members of our community. And that person is VK, Officer VK Simpson. And where, VK, where are you in that? Yay, all right. So to tell you about VK, it's, it's almost unheard of for an officer to serve as a community liaison for more than a couple of years. VK has actually served with us since 2008. VK joined us when George Bush was president. That's how long he goes back. So we 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 love him. Um, but he we're honored and we're blessed to have him. We are. There's a lot of us, as you can see. There's 67 of us on this. On 62 of us on this call, and there's about a thousand or so members. And we are a what what you call a high maintenance bunch. Okay. We have no shortage of needs, no shortage of questions, and we have no. And we have. I'm sure there's not many people on this call who have not texted or called VK with some problem that they've had, and he has been on it um, fast and attentive. He's been patient. He's worked hard. He's been at every board meeting, every neighborhood meeting. He's fielded questions on days off. I think even he was in Jamaica a couple of weeks ago celebrating his anniversary, and I think he was fielding some questions from there. Um, he has orchestrated traffic, the traffic trailers. He's orchestrated uh, the radar uh, enforcement that we've been doing recently. He's been the point man on larceny from auto that we uh, had had a problem with. He's done security for our home tours, security for our uh, Christmas tour, or the garden tour. He's been at er more meetings than anybody else on this board. He's been here longer than um, most people who live here. And I think we should probably buy him a house here soon because <laughs> <laughs> if he likes that idea. Yeah, um, maybe we get him get him like you know the McNinch house or get like the place at the Poplar or something. Whatever he wants, we're going to give him. But we do know that he's you know in maybe a few years he's going to retire. But we prohibit that. We do not want VK to retire. We're going to form a band around him. We're going to be like human shields, so VK cannot retire. Um, he, is, we are blessed to have him. We are honored to have him. And I think this neighborhood would be, would be much different were it not for VK. So if everybody could unmute, or Shirley, if you could unmute, unmute everybody, I'd like a round of applause from all 62 people who are here. So at the count of five, one, we're gonna unmute and then everybody's unmuted. And then VK is gonna get a Zoom round of applause from 62 or so people, if not more. So ready, one, two. That knows how to do that, because I don't know how to unmute everyone. All right, everybody Yay. unmute themselves. I think he's crying. <laughs> Thanks, well, we, Chris. We love you, and we, we appreciate everything that you've done for us uh, and, and continue to do for us, and we hopefully you'll be doing it for another 10 or 20 years. All right, well, um, is that my cue? <laughs> uh, I think it's, uh, I think we're going to go over to Captain Koch, who's going to introduce our, uh, you, you know how, you know how Brass works at VK, uh, Chief That's wants fine. to go. Yeah. All right, that'll work. All right. Hey, well, listen, uh, on behalf, it's, it's been, it, it is an honor to work with VK and uh, myself and uh, Lieutenant Brett Balamucky uh, and all the leadership within the Central Division uh, really appreciate the dedication and time that uh, VK spends with us. So uh, it is my honor and privilege to introduce our Chief of Police, uh, Johnny Jennings. He's been on the department since 1992 after he graduated from the, at the greatest university, according to him, in the country, Appalachian State University. Uh, chief was promoted to deputy chief in 2016. And in July of last year, he took over the helm of our department, has led us through uh, the, the tail end of the racial justice movement last summer through the Republican National Convention. And uh, who knows what will happen over the next couple of months and couple of years. But uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, our chief and your chief, Johnny Jennings, Chief Jennings. 
Hey, thanks, Brad. Uh, listen, I was going to make a joke and say that I was transferring VK out of Central, but I, th <laughs> I was afraid there'd be some things said that couldn't be taken back, so I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to go there, but uh, certainly appreciate uh, the support and partnership that Fourth Ward uh, has. I, I hear nothing but great things um, through Brad and the leadership at, at Central Central Division. Uh, Walter, I believe you even took part in our uh, course that, uh, that we had with Central. And uh, so, you know, one of the things that I want to make sure and that I've, I've continued to talk about through uh, my administration is that we are, we're going to collaborate with our citizens and our community. Uh, without that, we are worthless as a police department. If, if we think that we can tackle every issue on our own, uh, if we think that uh, that the community shouldn't have input in how they are policed. And, and you know, my goal is to have every community, uh, whether it's, you know, Fourth Ward, Hidden Valley, um, Valentine, it doesn't matter that, that it's a tailored response, that the community has some say in how that response is. Uh, and that we are, and if, if there are things that we can't do, uh, that we certainly want to make sure there's an understanding of why. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, you have great leadership. We've always, Central Division, we've always made sure that uh, we want to we wanna be able to serve that division appropriately, uh, and, and we are intentional about the people that we do put there. So uh, uh, I appreciate everyone, and, and just a matter of, uh, it's an honor for me to come in and, and talk with you and, uh, and to get to know each of you. Unfortunately, we're in a technology age with COVID, uh, and we're we're getting to a point now to where the first thing you say to everybody when you introduce yourselves is that I've had my shots. So I've had my shots and I look forward to maybe meeting everyone in person someday. So. Thanks, Chief. I think Chief Chris is gonna take the questions from the chat. Okay, okay. Uh, Chief Jennings um, and I could, I could, wow. Chief Jennings and I have go back a ways. Uh, back in the 90s, we were in the drug court together, and I was a young public defender, and he was a vice officer. I think you were you were with vice, and uh, I remember him as a man of integrity, and he was no nonsense. So I'm glad that he's chief now. Um, he's he's he's. We're, I'm very we're very happy about that. We've got some questions for you, chief. Um, from uh, would you address the nighttime noise from racing cars and motorcycle that have that have hyper mufflers to wake everyone sleeping from midnight to 3 a.m. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And, and yeah, it, it, listen, I, I didn't ignore your email. I still have it. So I just want to make sure that uh, I, I knew we were going to be on today with you as well. But uh, so this is a, a public nuisance that has been um, plaguing not just downtown area or Fourth Ward. Uh, we've had uh, all across uh, the city uh, complaints about the street racing and the, the loud mufflers and uh, everything else that that deal with the spinning of tires and things like that. So um, what we we have some state law. One of the things I get asked a lot is particularly from council members and, uh, you know, what can we do legislation wise to uh, help put some teeth into this when it when you're dealing with these vehicles and and how that it's dangerous and it's it's annoying to everyone. Uh, we do have some pretty substantial state law and some ordinances that deal with the loud mufflers and spinning of tires and organized street racing, uh, spontaneous street racing, things like that. Uh, the, the biggest way that we can hit them with the, particularly on the street racing end is to, to take their vehicles, uh, hit them where it hurts. And, and when you're able to build cases up and uh, and confiscate their vehicles and, and, and take them from them, then I think that's, that's going to leave the biggest impression on trying to deter that. And the hope is that word would get out that that's what CMPD does. So we've been able to, I know there's been a couple that we've already been able to do, but uh, CMPD has been working since October uh, on trying to uh, write the citations and, and deter some of this activity. Uh, since then, there's been thousands of tickets. Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think it was uh, close to 3,000 citations just on this team alone that's been working uh, this street racing and, and um, the vehicle nuisance cases. Uh, 
Uh, and then there's been a, a probably close to four uh, or maybe 2,500 or so traffic stops. So sometimes you get multiple citations, arrests. Uh, again, I we've confiscated a couple of vehicles as a result, but uh, the loud noise is a little bit different, a little bit more difficult to uh, take on because we'll get a phone call or a call for service of, of vehicles that are revving their engines and uh, doing um, spinning their tires. And by the time we get there, uh, those vehicles are gone or uh, those vehicles um, uh, either don't stop for us, which we have a no chase policy when it comes to uh, a fence in a, in a fence like that. Uh, so we have our challenges set out for us when we try to uh, try to take care of those issues. And I know Brad and his team has done a good job, whether it's been some of the ATVs that we've dealt with that have gone through the streets and, and also some of the some of the kids on the bicycles that have harassed vehicles and things like that. So multitude of problems when it comes to traffic issues in the Fourth Ward area. Okay, uh, thank you. And the, uh, another question is, what are the preparations for the pending verdict in Minneapolis? Okay, we, that's a very good question. We are, we are being told that we will get a notice prior to the verdict being read. Uh, so once the jury finishes deliberations and they come back with a verdict uh, across the nation, they're, they're going to hold that verdict and allow police departments to prepare uh, in that sense. We have, uh, uh, I can't get into full details of the operation plan, but uh, we do have an operations plan similar to other protests and, and uh, major events that you've seen in the uptown area. Uh, so we are going to make sure that our officers are prepared. Uh, we have enough people and let's just hope that anything that comes out and spills out in the streets is, are peaceful because once uh, if they're peaceful, we can manage that very easily. Uh, when rioters turn into criminal act, I'm sorry, when protests turn into criminal activity, that turns into riots and that makes it more challenging for our officers. Thank you. What should members of the public do if we witness unsafe driving? Really we are really concerned about injuries. Yeah, so we, the message we've been trying to put out is a lot of people, everyone has a cell phone. Uh, we do get a lot of video, we get a lot of photos and license plate numbers, uh, things like that, that we will, uh, that we, we have a team of people and, and Major Johnson is actually overseeing uh, these operations. So we will make sure that they get that information. Uh, and believe it or not, some of that, when we do get those videos and, and um, uh, the pictures and, and information like that, tag numbers, a lot of people think that that information goes nowhere. We really don't pay much attention to it, but some of it uh, helps us compile cases and, and to, to determine that we have the right people and identifying the people that we're going after as well. So uh, those are very meaningful. Uh, we do get a lot of those, so you have to be patient with us, but uh, we, we do uh, actually look at those and make sure that uh, they're put in the appropriate hands to, complete, to continue investigations uh, for some of these street racing issues. When, uh, when you see those videos, do you ever go to the people's homes and say, hey, we saw you out there last night and perhaps track down the owners of the vehicles and say, we're watching what you've been reported? Yeah, we, we, uh, we don't go to their homes that I know of. Now, I, I haven't instructed to go to homes. We do write letters uh, to let people know to put them on notice. Uh, and we also, uh, you know, because... In, unless we can actually prove who's driving, we have the owner of the vehicle that we can always notify. And sometimes, believe it or not, it's it's uh, little Junior who took dad's car out and dad had no idea he was drag racing with it. So uh, sometimes those situations can take care of themselves. But, but we do want to make sure that people know that, hey, we see you out there. Uh, we know what you're doing. And, uh, and that continues. The investigation is going to continue as well. So. Uh, at a recent board meeting, VK had shared with us that there were some new strategies that were being devised uh, to handle the speeding because there is a there is a lot of concerns about the the speeding here, and I think it's probably one of the biggest things we've been hearing about in the last year or so. And it's only a matter of time before somebody gets hurt or killed, and people are up in arms about it. Um, can you share with us what any of those new strategies are? Well, I, I think uh, long-term investigations are, are going to be key into uh, stopping what 
uh, this trend of speed race. We're not the only city in uh, in the country. Believe it or not, I've uh, talked to other major city chiefs, and uh, they they are knocking their heads against the wall just like we are with the same issues. Uh, I don't know what it is. It's why it's a national trend to all of a sudden uh, shut down streets and and drag race and do all of that that we're seeing a lot more of that since I've been on. I've I've never seen it this bad, uh, but. You know, strategies also include um, some work with intelligence that uh, what people don't see and realize is there are a lot of events that have tried to uh, gain ground and take place that because of our intelligence work and some of the things that we've done, we've been able to get out in front of it and actually stop it from occurring or, or go to their gathering places and break the crowds up. Uh, of course, the frustration is always, like I said, they'll they, they won't stop for us to take off and, and we're not going to chase endangering uh, more lives out there to chase a vehicle for that. But, uh, but I think the message needs to be that we're going to continue to work on it and we're going to continue to try and break these, uh, particularly on the uh, organized and planned street racing. Uh, we're going to keep doing that. So. Um, you had mentioned that uh, CMPD has a no chase policy and, I, and that's understandable given where we live, uh, but Highway Patrol does not have a no chase policy. Is it possible you could have a task force with CMPD and Highway Patrol? This way, you could take advantage of their different policy. Yeah, well, let me tell you, the Highway Patrol, uh, CMPD, uh, even other counties, uh, the sheriff's office—they've all worked in conjunction with us since October, uh, and they've been helping with that. Now, the Highway Patrol very limited resources. Uh, there, there are very few uh, troopers that are in our area, as you would think, because they're, as we all fight our uh, issues with uh, vacancy rate, Highway Patrol is not immune to that either. So we have been working with them. Uh, I, I, I like the question, but I'm going to be honest, I, I don't want them chasing, <laughs> chasing these cars either. So uh, even with their no chase policy, I would, I would not like to see uh, us getting into a she situation where we're chasing those vehicles. Okay. Um, what about scooters going 20 miles an hour on sidewalks? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, I don't know if Brad can, what is the, what is the regulation speed for the scooters? I, I, I know we had talked about, uh, I thought it was less than that, but you know, we are, I remember when those came out in the issues that, uh, not just on the sidewalks, but also uh, disobeying uh, the, the red lights and, and crosswalk and, and vehicle accidents that we've had with that. But Brad, I, you might be able to answer that a lot better than I can because I, I haven't dealt with it as much as you have. Yeah, sure, Chief. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Yeah, great question. And, uh, you know, as we work uh, on an education piece and work with CDOT and park it to make sure um, that those do go. They don't go any faster than 15 miles an hour, but certainly we try to keep them on the roadway and making sure that they go with traffic is the way that they're supposed to go. Um, and so keeping them off the sidewalk so people do not get hit is, is a real challenge. And uh, a lot of that is through the education piece. And as we continue to see more people return uptown, I'm confident that uh, there will be a lot more scooters out and about um, and, and certainly uh, be something that we'll work through. Okay, um, question, it, it is so difficult to understand why people want to drag race on city streets and disturb residents in the middle of the night. Any idea why they do it? Yeah, I, you know, I can't think of anything other, you know, it's, I don't know if it's a coincidence or maybe not that we are in a pandemic. Uh, all of a sudden, I think people are looking for things of what so-called recreation. Uh, and, you know, I, that's the only thing that I can put together at this point, because uh, like I said, I've been, I've been on this department 29 years. Uh, and I know we've had vehicle issues when it comes to cruising and things like that, but I've never seen it this bad when it comes to drag racing to where the multitude of people uh, that are in, in the, the, they're just emboldened to go out, uh, whether it's 
485 or uh, side streets or whatever, they'll stop traffic and just and put lives in danger. So uh, I don't know what the uh, the only thing I can figure is that there's a lot more time on people's hands uh, and they're trying to find more ways to uh, entertain themselves. And unfortunately, this is a dangerous way to do that if that's what it is. And, you know, we just have to send a message and continue sending a message that uh, if you're going to put other people's lives in danger, then there are going to be consequences behind your actions. And, and I, I think we're going to be able to do that successfully. So. And a question uh, from Brooks, how can we as individuals and as a community show our support for the police? Well, that's a fantastic question. And thank you. You know, I, I had a conversation with uh, uh, an executive today and uh, they were, you know, the, the message was, hey, every time I see somebody uh, with CMPD or is in the uniform, I thank them for their service. I thank them for what they do. Uh, and, and, you know, my comment to, uh, to that person was, you know, we may not always show it, but that goes such a long way in how much we appreciate it. Whenever I hear that, uh, it, it, it just brightens me up and knows that uh, with all the challenges out there that uh, and I tell my officers that for every one one loud voice that you hear that that vilifies your profession, there's a thousand that you don't hear uh, that support what we do and, and that are stand behind us. And they realize that uh, that we're human beings who are going to make mistakes. Uh, and, you know, I think we need to be measured by when those mistakes are made, what we do there. So the support that you all have with the division uh, is I think I think you probably have other divisions that are uh, envious of that. But if we can, if that continues and and to continue building those relationships, reach out uh, and and have conversations with your officers outside of needing them, uh, then that's going to go a long way as well. But just just to just those little gestures. It's not about you know what we can give to the officers or what we can uh, what you know what events we can have, but just a little gestures of welcoming, welcoming them to the community. Uh, just like you, I think someone mentioned that BK has been a part of your community for so many years, and that's what we want to hear, and that's how we, that's what we strive to be as part of the community, so. Well, to that point, I would, I would add that we offer, what we offer to the department is that we will, we will go to court to support your officers and support your cases. We, we have done that in the past. Uh, we've gone, there was a, a case, probably about 10 or so years ago, there's a robbery case and it was a pr pretty vicious robbery on 8th Street. And we had about 12 people who went to the bond hearing when the, per when the uh, defendant was trying to get out of jail. And we made our, we couldn't speak, of course, but we made our presence known. And, and it, is, it is something that we offered to you, to your department or your, and this division, that if there's a problem, is a particular problem, let's say you have a, a bad traffic situation, we will go to court and be there as part of the community. And I do think that that has an impression upon the DA as well as the judges who see that. And I know that Spencer Merriweather has come to our meetings when he was running for office and, you know, he's aware of our involvement. We've had other of his assistants there and they're aware of our, 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 uh, our involvement and our passion to keep our community safe. So that is something that an arrow you could put into your quiver. Um, but Chris, yeah, back. let me, I hate to interrupt. Let me tell you, I, I certainly appreciate hearing that. And, and I think there's going to be some opportunity to uh, take you all up on that. So that's, that's fantastic uh, to hear. Well, we'll be there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, getting back to one of the other questions, um, are the drag races violating the city noise ordinance? And, and I guess the city noise ordinance is kind of a funny duck. And maybe you could try yeah. to, you know, explain that and, it's you know it's 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 tricky. Yeah, I will, I will try. Now the, the drag racers, the noise ordinance um, with the city, it's a loud muffler ordinance that also includes the spinning of tires and, and uh, uh, just the nuisance of the vehicle itself. Uh, it's difficult for us to uh, you know we can't put a noise meter on the uh, on the vehicles when you know when, and once we a lot of times uh, those mufflers. Uh, they, from what I've seen, I saw one today, as a matter of fact, that it was, it wasn't making the loud muffler noise, but if they, if he was to sit on the accelerator, you knew that it would probably be outside of ordinance to do that. 
So, um, uh, so that's a difficult one for us to, uh, to charge someone with and write a citation for. Uh, however, uh, when you get to a point of drag racing or, or uh, reckless driving, that's easy. You know, we, uh, uh, we can do that. And if we charge them with the state statute and chapter 20 laws, we can uh, confiscate their vehicles as well. And that's, to me, that's the ultimate goal. And that's the way to send the message is to uh, hitting them in the wallets and taking their vehicles. Do you, do you find that you're reluctant or there's maybe some reluctance to charge uh, for equipment violations like that because they usually get plea bargained away and they're just not worth the effort? Not at all. Uh, I, there's no reluctance on our part. You know, this is a, a conversation I've had with uh, DA Spencer uh, Mayweather as well, uh, that we, you know, we have a job to do still. I know he has a difficult position uh, with the backlog and, and things that, you know, he, he has no choice but to prioritize those uh, cases in, unless he wants to be five years behind schedule on, on uh, cases. Uh, I think he, he has an obligation to uh, prioritize. So uh, we will continue doing what we do on that end. Uh, however, uh, I know there are some things that the court system is looking at uh, that we will, that will kind of change and, and, hopefully uh, speed up the process of going to court and, and uh, adjudicating citations and things uh, that will be coming on this year. So, uh, which, you know, hopefully that'll make sure that people, you know, you don't have to physically go to court. You can, uh, all of the information is in, uh, is computerized and digital because there's a lot of things and Chris probably knows that uh, a lot of things with court systems are so antiquated at this point that uh, it's time to really upgrade and, and, and uh, you know, use the technology that we have that's out there. So. Gee, thank you. Chris, I'm going to uh, jump in. Uh, yeah, I think Lawyer McKee then had a question here. Well, I, um, I want to cut out. Okay. We've got a commitment to the neighborhood to, to stop at 730. I think we can catalog the questions for uh, Captain Koch and, and Chief Jennings, if we could. But I want to thank you for leading this discussion. Um, so a lot of comments thanking the police department, BK, Captain Koch, and all of the central division. So that's wonderful. Um, thank you. I'd like to thank everyone who participated this evening. I appreciate your interest and your support of Fourth Ward CLT. And Chief Jennings, thank you very, very much. Loved your presence here tonight. Um, and and anytime. we have a social committee meeting immediately after the uh, fourth ward meeting anyone that wants to stay jasmine is going to hold a mini social meeting Great. so see please you guys. stay thanks vk we'll see you stay safe thank, thank you, you walter guys. i'll be glad to come back and update again later uh appreciate you having me uh, you're very welcome thanks for thank joining you. us so social committee people hang out for that it should be fun and thanks again for attending i really appreciate your interest and your participation Good night all who everyone to everyone who's going. Jasmine, yeah. are you ready? Yeah, I'll go ahead and get started. I was gonna let people log off so it wasn't so distracting, but I'll, I'll go ahead and get started because I'm gonna share my screen one more time. Um, I did, let me see if I can find my screen, sorry. All right. Um, so you guys should be able to see this. I just updated the, the QR code. So um, one thing I did want to mention, um, for those of you that are sticking around, I appreciate it. Um, if you have any interest in uh, the survey or helping us um, on the social committee, um, the survey is going to really help parse out um, all of those details in terms of where your focus area could uh, really be of help for us, as well as little things um, in terms of uh, commitment, for example. Um, I think I mentioned this uh, early on in the year that I have a, a four-year-old, so, um, and, and I'm a corporate mommy, so I'm spread pretty thin as it is, um, but Goal here is to not add additional work to anybody, just to collaborate. I think if anything, if you just like to brainstorm and have great ideas, I'd love for you to just sit on the committee um, for some of those brainstorming sessions. Um, 
And so if you are interested, please, um, you know, do the questionnaire. Um, you can use the link here. Actually, let me go ahead and paste it into the messages if I can find it. Um, so click on chat in the middle bottom. There we go. Yeah, when I um, when I shared my screen, I lost everything. <laughs> there we go. Um, all right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second. And oh, Bill says we're still recording.